Hey, it's me again. Thank you so much for continuing to come back. This is going to be part four of the Clio Institute's asynchronous version of our Clio Speakers Network. We've covered the signs and impacts of climate change. So we know who is being impacted and how, what is going on both on the ground and in the larger atmosphere. And we've seen that there are so many solutions that are already being implemented on smaller scales that we need to scale up or in the works and ready to go. But the thing is, all of that knowledge doesn't actually help if we don't implement it. So effective communication and civic action is basically getting folks on board to join you in your climate journey and mobilizing large numbers of people to make changes at the systemic scales that are needed. Again, no one person got us into this mess and no one person is going to get it out. If we want to make the changes, we're going to need to work together. So let's see some of the best ways to do that. Some of the focuses that we're going to be looking at today is common ground and solutions. I've said it before, but you know, I will, I'll talk to a flat earther if they like solar panels, okay? We're probably not going to be friends beyond this one particular issue, but if that's a solution they'll get on board with, fine, let's move, you know, let's move along. Uh, we want to counter misinformation, although there will be a more in-depth session on that next, advocating for collective action, and as part of that, telling your climate story. Because Folks are mobilized by stories and narratives, and they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. And so by giving them a window into where you're coming from, you're a lot more likely to get that kind of emotional connection that doesn't just get people to sign a petition, but to really stay long term with the movement and emotionally invest in it. Now, I don't expect you to spend probably a cumulative hundreds of hours in professional development around science and communication and community involvement. It's my job to do all of that and to distill it for you. So part of this is coming from the National Network of Ocean and Climate Change Interpreters, or NOKI. Their training is fantastic and they do have some introductory courses available for folks. Um, and that's where I get this concept of the swamp which is where we sort of get bogged down in these unproductive areas and ideas of climate change. And it just doesn't really get us where we need to go. So in this case, we're looking at climate versus weather. In red, we see that climate equals weather. Uh, folks who are confused about the difference between climate and that hole in the ozone I mentioned earlier, which Really, it's two different kinds of pollution causing two different problems, and they're not particularly related, although it's understandable for people to mix them up. And the idea that this is a big, scary, depressing, overwhelming system that they can't really impact. So we want to avoid that and redirect folks away from those lines of thinking and take them, if they're in the yellow, then sort of directing them toward the green and say, okay, here is what can be done, here is what needs to be done, and this is how we'll move forward. We will have a list of links available on uh, the Clio website, so if you want to look at these resources, we have them for you. When we explain climate change, not everyone wants to sit through, again, hours of lectures or even shorter video sessions like this. Having a short, snappy way to explain climate change and what's going on is really essential to kind of make your elevator pitch. If you remember back in session two, I talked about the heat trapping blanket as a metaphor to help you understand the greenhouse effect. How your body radiates heat, just like the Earth's surface does where sunlight comes through the atmosphere, is absorbed by the surface, and radiates back out, and that the greenhouse gases act as a blank to trap those against the surface of the earth, creating a livable environment for us. And that at normal levels of greenhouse gases, what we've been used to at pre-industrial levels, 
This keeps Earth right in that Goldilocks zone of temperatures that are most comfortable for us and for the animals and plants that we've co-evolved with over the past couple million years. But when the blanket gets too thick, when you have rampant greenhouse gases, that's when you run into problems. And since most folks have experienced a blanket that is too heavy, this is something concrete and easy to grasp. And I tell you, it works with small children as well. So analogies are taking this kind of nebulous concept that can be a little bit abstract and giving folks something concrete to compare it to that they've probably experienced in their everyday lives. The other thing you want to do is appeal directly to people's values. Responsible management is a big one where people from all across the political spectrum can really get together and say, okay, we have this many resources. This is the rate at which they replenish themselves. How can we best use them and distribute them so that we're not running into a debt or deficit? And that can apply to money in a budget. That can apply to our carbon budget. That can apply to groundwater. And so by getting folks on board with, again, not going straight into the science of how an aquifer replenishes itself and how climate change might impact that, but saying this is what we know we have and how can we best spend it for the good of everyone, that can get past some of the defensiveness or just inability to grasp that bigger concept. And again, bring it back down to something that is concrete and easy to understand. So you want to introduce values early on in the conversation to talk about what's at stake and why it matters. This is something that I did for these sessions where I started in with climate justice and adherence to facts of taking the information from government agencies and making it digestible to folks. And of course, my own climate story, where I told you that I've been like this since I was a small child, and absolutely no one is surprised by how I turned out. When you need to get people to care, you lean on these values, and you prime them for a civic mindset versus one that is more individualistic. Because, as I said before, we're not going to get there with these individualistic solutions. So we want to start with those values and then start presenting solutions because I trust me, I get it when you think about how much there is to be done and how much is at stake and it can be really overwhelming and difficult emotionally. So we want to transition from values to solutions early, but we do still have to make sure that they match the scope of the problem because when you're told that the very balance of the planet is at risk here of reaching these tipping points and losing whole ecosystems, doing a beach cleanup feels kind of hollow. This is how we get folks to go from individual to collective action. And presenting these solutions as a community effort. Another thing uh, about being a community effort is that there are additional values folks have around working together and helping one's neighbor, where the underlying issues about exactly how much carbon is in the atmosphere and how much heat it traps and complex mathematical equations, you don't need to delve into those. For people to say, you know, I've definitely noticed that my child has a harder time with their asthma when they have to take the bus and stand by the bus depot where the buses are running on diesel fuel. So you can narrow the scope down to their individual family and then expand it back out to air pollution in the city. And if you've ever heard the phrase, think globally, act locally, here is where you can start. So when we're looking at effective solutions, we've got two main themes here, energy shift which is moving away from fossil fuels and these polluting sources of energy, and energy efficiency, which is acknowledging that for the time being, a lot of folks are still relying on natural gas or coal-fired power plants, but if we use less electricity you know, right now, 
it's still going to have benefits. And as we transition the grid, the less demand there is on it, the easier that transition is going to be. Okay, so I've used the term collective action a bunch of times before. What does that mean? Well, thankfully here in the US, we do have a democratic system, which means that the average citizen can make their voice heard. And with other citizens and members of their community, um, you know, push the government at the municipal, state, or even federal level to make the changes that they think make society better. When it comes to contacting elected officials, we can definitely help with that. Clio usually has some kind of action alert going around with suggested talking points. You want to find the person at the correct level of government to solve your problem. For example, if you're interested in environmental education, well, for the most part, you can look to your local school district within your city or county, or you can look at the state level. There is a Department of Education on the federal level, but choices about curriculum are largely made by the states and then implementation by the school districts within those states. Note where the office is. If you can make a physical visit, or sometimes you'll have folks touring their districts, for example, a local representative here does a something called coffee with constituents, where she on certain days of the week will be at various local independent coffee shops and anyone can make an appointment to sit down and chat with her about issues both big and small. Following them on social media or signing up for their newsletters once you figure out who your representative is, is a great way to hear about these kinds of opportunities. And don't be upset if you don't talk to the actual elected official, but you're referred to one of their aides. Those aides are powerful. A lot of the time, they decide what issues get pushed to the elected official. They decide what to prioritize and sort of triage requests as they come in. They do a lot of the background research to help these folks make decisions on aspects of their job that may not be within their expertise. Sending physical mail, things like postcard campaigns, they can be nice to do um, as a group project, but it doesn't really build a relationship the same way that phone calls or especially in-person meetings do. So there are more effective ways to go about it. The top three things you can do right now is getting to know your Florida state legislators, what their committee assignments are. When a bill gets put to the committee, this is the first place that it's going to get reviewed and rewritten and changes made before it goes onto the floor. So if the committee dealing with energy is looking at a bill that deals with energy and they decide not to even put it up for a vote, then anyone who's not on the committee hasn't had a chance to say much about it by that point. And figure out what their positions are on your issues. Arguing with them is not super effective. You can advocate for your cause, but don't forget that if your representatives are already thinking along the same lines that you are, you want to tell them that you, as their constituent, agree with those positions. Because folks in uh, positions of power get a lot of complaints, and rightfully so, they are beholden to the people who put them into office. But it can also be really impactful to let them know that some certain thing that they're doing is something that their constituents really support. And you can send thank you letters to them as well. Uh, organizations often do this when they're pushing for specific legislation and their representative sponsors or advocates for it. Try to introduce yourself either via email or in person before we're in a high pressure situation like the legislative session or an election year. If you can build a relationship with your elected officials year round and throughout the season, then once you really have a request that you want to want to push, there might be a lot more conducive to that. And there are community events, town halls. Uh, I've seen a lot of these virtually via Facebook or Zoom or other social media channels that you might be affiliated with or in person and you can support or pressure your legislator depending on what their position is and what you want the outcome to be. And this can also make it a lot less intimidating than trying to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. When, for example, you're working with your local Autobahn club 
and you want some regulation that will protect birds. Well, when you walk in with a group of other bird lovers, then it can become a lot easier to take that position. And I totally understand that not everyone is very comfortable with public speaking. So especially when you have a group like that and many folks will be speaking, you can show that you support it and uh, support that position without necessarily having to be put on the spot yourself. So it depends on what you're comfortable with, really. Now, public speaking is pretty high up on the list of things many people are afraid of doing. And it's understandable. Uh, when it comes to, you know, talking from a podium uh, in public speaking engagements, it's really a skill that anyone can learn. You want to try to be professional, keep your language professional, practice ahead of time. A lot of verbal filler, your likes and ums and you knows, they can make it seem like you don't know what you're talking about, even if you absolutely do. Provide your information. They want to make sure that you actually are one of their constituents. So they'll probably ask you for your name and potentially your address, although that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily go out loud. You want to bring your knowledge on the issue and always be polite and thank the staff for their time and consideration because we understand that you're passionate and that some decisions that your local government makes might make you angry, but they get yelled at a lot. And so it really causes folks to get defensive and tune you out. You can also contact local news stations if you have a story that you think would be relevant to folks in your community, writing op-eds to local papers. Clio offers letter to the editor training especially for our youth advocates. So we have many of them, uh, even high school and college students that are getting published in local newspapers and talking about these issues and various you know, bills and legislation that they either do or don't wanna see passed or other issues that the elected officials should be focusing on. You can testify at commission or council meetings. There might be proposed change in your city for example, zoning for new buildings or deciding where to put a public park. And they'll often post on the website the calendar. I know that it can be difficult to get to them, especially if you are working, you know, crazy schedule. But post COVID, many of them have the option to attend via Zoom. I have been in City Hall, I have been in the council chambers, and they have a big projector and they'll have folks who speak in person at the podium, and they'll make time for folks who are attending virtually to speak as well and play it for everyone. So if that's an option and it works for you, absolutely take advantage of it. And there are email campaigns. When you send an email to an elected official, they are required to read it and respond. You're probably just going to get a form letter response, but don't be discouraged because if you are for or against a particular you know, a particular issue, a particular piece of legislation, Who, whatever aide is answering that email has to note so many constituents are for or against it. And that even if you individually don't feel like you had a big impact, those numbers add up and that can absolutely change their behavior. When you do testify, take a, take a deep breath, present professionally and stick to the facts. Even if you know that a certain person on your city council or in the legislature has done certain things or has a certain position, you want to avoid talking about them personally. You want to take a knowledgeable approach and not one that is necessarily attacking anyone who's there. Practice in advance. You don't need to read verbatim. They don't offer teleprompters to, uh, <laughs> they don't offer teleprompters to every, just everyone, but you can have your notes on a note card. You don't need to read it verbatim. Just have the gist of what you're going to say ready. And as always, thank the chair and the commission members for their time. They will remember that you are polite. So you want to stay away from any kind of emotional outburst, you can definitely speak forcefully and with passion. I'm not telling you to go be a robot, but again, you've we've probably all seen some of the yelling back and forth that's happened uh, on the local or national news. 
and we all know how that looks. So let's try to let's try to keep it civil. Project your voice, but don't yell. If you know any teachers, they're probably really good at this. So uh, <laughs> they might be a good person to help you with that. Avoid street clothes and dress professionally. You know, you're in their world. I understand that it's not always the person who wears the fanciest clothes who knows the most, but we'll do our best on that one. And try to avoid, for sure, talking on your phone. But don't be on your phone the whole time. Try to pay attention to the proceedings. Bring a notebook and take notes if that's something you're interested in, because all they have to look at is you. And again, coming across as prepared and professional is a really big part of being taken seriously. So if you take all of this into consideration, work on building relationships with those elected officials, connect with organizations like Cleo, hi. And if you follow our newsletter and our social media, you can learn about rallies, strikes, lobbying days, commission meetings. Uh, take note of what the opportunities are in your city. Do you have a comprehensive plan for the city? Are they seeking public comment? Are there citizen advisory boards that you could uh, that you could be a part of? Not only will this help you to reach your goals as part of your climate journey, but you can make friends and connections within your within your city. Everything that you do to make your city better in terms of climate impacts is going to have additional positive effects. If you're reducing the amount of you're reducing the amount of emissions that are coming out of your bus fleet, you're also reducing the air pollution that you and uh, other residents are breathing. If you're pushing for more bike paths, that's good for people's physical and mental health to get outside more and again to connect with other human beings. So focus on the little wins too. And remember that every step you take forward is a step forward. And no, none of us are going to make this happen alone. But if we all push in our own little corner of the world to move this forward, then we can make a lot of progress. Because you will not always be successful on the first or the second or the third attempt. Our youth advocates spent three years lobbying elected officials, writing, revising, going back and forth before we finally got a climate emergency resolution passed here in Leon County where I live. It, there was a lot of rejection and being run around from one person to the next. And it was really hard, you know, emotionally. So that's another benefit of connecting with folks like Cleo and other people in your city is that when you do encounter those setbacks, you have folks to commiserate with and to support you and to push you to keep going. No one expects you to do this by yourself. I'll be honest, when I talk to a lot of people about civic engagement, strikes and rallies are really the only thing that they think of, which I'll admit, this is often kind of the fun part. You get to make signs and do chants, and it can be a really good way to build community and build morale with other folks and to build coalitions. There are other organizations besides Clio, wherever you're at, that they may not be necessarily focused on exactly what we're focused on, but our interests align in many ways. And this can help to get legislators to pay attention because they can see a large number of people with a similar goal that we have the ability to rally support. And it can also be a great way to let off some let off some steam and just look around and see how many people here care about this issue and are on your side and are with you. So how do we get all of these folks rallied together? Well, you may have read before a book that was set in a certain historical period and thought to yourself, if I was there, if I lived, you know, during the, during the Civil War or during the women's rights movement, what would I have done? Well, here's the thing. You're living through history right now. And you might think what has changed in the past that could impact the future, but changes in the present can impact the future. So we're all watching the climate crisis unfold 
and seeing how it impacts us and our families and our communities. And by sharing those stories and uplifting others to share theirs. Folks who may not feel comfortable in certain spaces, who may not have been welcomed in certain spaces. It can be really powerful to not only tell your own story, but to listen to other people. So anything that relates to your personal experience of climate change, one that's you know, descriptive and personal. Uh, for me, I remember evacuating before Hurricane Michael hit Tallahassee. And I remember trying to find some place that I could go where I could take my cats. Because I, I said, look, if it's dangerous enough that I need to evacuate, they're coming with me. And if it's safe enough for them to stay here, I'll be staying put as well. There is no circumstance in which I get out of harm's way and I abandon them. And, you know, a lot of people do really care about their pets and consider them to be members of their family. And having to think about making those choices and accessing those resources. I actually stayed with a friend and their apartment complex generally didn't allow pets. But we basically called them up and, and explained, we're evacuating from a hurricane. Could we please get, you know, could we please get a little leniency for three to five days just to make sure that none of us are home if a tree falls on the house? Thankfully, they did let us go. But again, that was, that was really anxiety producing for me. And we came back and actually the tree fell from our yard onto a neighbor's house. So that was its own uh, not particularly enjoyable aftermath. Prompts to get you started. You can think about your role and responsibilities around climate change. You know, what is your position maybe at work, in your family, or in your community? What are your thoughts on, you know, climate change situations? There's a lot of fiction being written. It's often called cli-fi that can both look at dystopian ways that this could play out, as well as, you know, more hopeful, uh, more hopeful scenarios. I think reading both is important. Reading this really, for me at least, reading the really depress depressing dark fiction helps me contextualize, okay, my worst fears have been realized in this world. How are people surviving and how are they dealing with it? And then you can also look at, you know, again, the more hopeful, what does it look like in a green and resilient future? You can identify the barriers in battling climate change. Maybe you're facing those yourself and talk about solutions and what the impact is of taking action against climate change. Are the current actions being taken uh, sufficient to minimize these impacts? Or think about a child in your life. You know, they might ask, why isn't more being done? And this is the key. How do we stay hopeful? Because we know that the situation is dire. But we know that together, we can make the difference. And this is what I mean when I talk about a more hopeful future. A living economy where communities can care for one another, where we don't have huge highways bisecting neighborhoods and people are able to walk to school, walk with one another, more community centers, places where people are not expected to be spending money, that we have more civic investment and more sustainable, regenerative ways of feeding ourselves. And we can make that better world, but we can only do it if we work together. So who's with me? <laughs>